Hello, pup parents, and welcome to today's episode of the Perfect Pup Podcast. My name is Devin. I am extremely excited. Today, we have an awesome guest. We have Richard Gonzalez on with us, and we're going to be covering an awesome topic. But first of all, Richard, thank you much. Thank you so much for joining us on the episode. Thank you so much for having me, Devin. I really appreciate being here. Of course. I, I can't wait for this. In today's episode, we're going to cover a topic that I think is one of the biggest struggles that we have as pup parents, and that is trying to help our dogs generalize behaviors or help them, you know, it can be called proofing behaviors in a whole variety of environments. And so we're going to dive into that, dive into why it happens, dive into what we can do to help improve um, our dog's ability to, you know, continue those behaviors even in difficult environments. But before that, I want to give an overview um, of Richard and just kind of give you some, some of the notes that he sent over to me. Um, I will read some of it. You'll see me glancing down because there's a lot here and I, I like it. I think it's all you know, worth noting. So Richard said he's, he's been learning dog behavior since 2010. Um, and he was uh, introduced to a service dog organization in San Diego while on active duty as a Marine. Um, at that time, he was um, undergoing some medical recovery due to combat related wounds. Um, and that's when he really started to kind of discover his love for animal behavior and learning theory. Um, and it's been a really big part of his recovery um, from wounds and, and, and combat related um, injuries and his reintegration back in to society. And on that note too, I'll kind of keep going after, but I, I already, I just want to give gratitude again and say, I'm grateful for your service. And, and I'm, I'm sure we'll cover that a little bit more. Um, and so his credentials, of course, we got, we got to go over the credentials, right? Uh, Richard is, he graduated from the Applied Animal, Animal Behavior Program at the University of Washington. Uh, he's an, a graduate of the Karen Pryor Academy. He is a certified professional dog trainer through CCPDT. And he is an AKC Good Citizen Evaluator. So there's a whole lot of acronyms in there. I probably won't read each of them. But um, And then he was a lead dog trainer at Petco, went through their certification program. And he is a Puppy Start Right instructor through the Karen Pryor Academy. He's always attending conferences, you know, continual learning, something we talk a lot about on this podcast that I think is so important. And I'm going to pick out two of the fun facts. I said, you got to send me fun facts. And I'm going to I'm gonna give you my two favorite and then you know, I'll, I'll give it over to you to say a little more, but he served in the U.S. Marine Corps for 12 years uh, and was retired due to wounds sustained from combat. And his first service dog licked former First Lady Michelle Obama's leg, which, I mean, th that's like the, the winner for like fun facts and trivia. I, d I don't know how anybody could beat that. Yeah. It, it, was, uh, it was pretty funny I, uh, about that, uh, that event. So I was uh, as a Marine and, and wounded in combat and so I was recovering at the Wounded Warrior Battalion um, at Camp Pendleton and uh, we had a visit from uh, the former uh, First Lady uh, and she was there and she was in, being introduced to me and uh, my children and my service dog and our service dogs are meant to you know kind of be out of out of the spotlight and just you know when we need and things like that so uh, I'm sitting and we're talking and I looked down and I noticed that my service dog Charlie had been licking uh, uh, Miss Obama's leg for like the last minute and a half, and I was like, I was like, uh, like just like kind of like I didn't know what to do, and I was just like, I am so sorry. And she says, Don't even worry about it. Bo does it to me all the time. Bo was uh, is, was their dog, and he and she said that it must have been the lemon uh, cocoa butter that she puts on. She said Bo loves it as well. So it was it was right a uh, it was a really cool moment and uh, really fun to see. That is that is an amazing story. I I love I love that. Um, so in, anything else I missed on your on your intro? I know I know I covered a lot of the points there, but anything else you want to cover on just kind of who you are and and why you're a dog trainer? Yeah. So um, a little bit about me. I and, and I haven't done a lot of lives just because um, I am, you know, I, I I've been trying to find my path on what I want to do in this industry, and I'm finding that like. I love to advocate for our animals, you know, uh, understanding how they communicate and kind of bridging that gap with pet parents and um, building those relationships so that the, the, the pet and the pet guardian can understand each other and meet each other's needs and be able to live happily and successfully in a world that they've created together for each other. I love that. And I, I, I love the word guardian as well. You know, even us here at Pupford, we try to, we don't use the word owner because, you know, I, I think that has a, a incorrect connotation and it's something, it's one of some of those 
you know, the jargon and the words that have been in the pet industry for too long. And I, I love that term of guardian because I do think that, you know, both us as the humans and the dogs, like we can be guardians for each other. And I love, love, love that. Um, and so on that note, let's dive into this first thing because for for all of us pup parents listening, we've we've experienced this before where, you know, you you get your dog to do a 30 second stay in your living room and you're stoked. And you're like, all right, let's go to the park and let's test this out. There's, you know, cars driving by, bikes, and they just, it seems like they don't understand it at all. So why, the first question, why is it so difficult for our dogs to understand behaviors in like new slash challenging environments? Yeah, that's a really great question. And um, kind of one of the things that I've seen uh, throughout my time teaching and learning animal behavior, and as well as being a, a pet guardian, is I don't know how many times where you have uh, gotten excited where you've taught your dog something and you're like, look, 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 I want to show you, you know, uh, Hilo can go ahead and balance, uh, you know, a, a, a toy on his nose. Right. And then, so you bring everybody over and you're like, look, look, look. And then you, you, you know, you try to go for it and, and it's not happening. Right. And you're like, what? Like I, it just was going on. Like, no, like really guys, he knows how to do this. And, and everybody's just waiting, waiting, and, you're, and, you know, and, you're, and it's not happening. And that's because the situation has changed, right? It's no longer you and your dog working on one individual task. Now you have people that have come around. There's excitement. There's talk. So your environment has changed, ultimately making that behavior that you were just working on a totally different behavior. And a simple, a simple answer to that question is, Dogs do not generalize the same way that we do as humans. So a sit in the living room is not the same behavior as a sit in the parking lot at your local grocery store. So that's the simple answer. And, um, and why it's challenging is because we've, we've grown with this expectation that if we've taught our dog the behavior in one location or environment, that it's the same in another location environment. And that's, that's incorrect. And, and that actually leads perfectly into my next question, which is, you know, what should our expectations be? You know, how can we, because I think, like you said, I've been guilty of that, where in my head, I'm thinking, no, Sunny knows this. She knows how to do this. She knows recall, like, and then we get somewhere and she, you know, doesn't seem to know it. So what, what should we be doing as pup parents to kind of tame our expectations with behaviors in new environments? Yeah. Um, I, I appreciate you asking that because um, without that knowledge, we will never learn to do better, right? And um, so that's one of my missions is to educate people on what to do and, and change mindsets. So one of the things that we can do to actually help uh, tame our uh, expectations of what, what we would like our dog to do is First, we need to understand some some terms. So, you know, generalization, uh, fluency, um, proofing, those are all things, you know, the three Ds as well. Those are things that I think need to be a lot more um, known as pet guardians and in the industry as well for people to start learning these things. So uh, generalization is basically your dog um, is able to apply the concept in a various, uh, in various environments or situations, right? Um, and fluency doesn't happen without generalization. Mm -hmm. And so fluency is basically your dog performs the desired behavior correctly, smoothly, and with, um, without any hesitation. So there is, it's not just, hey, we taught our dog sit in the, in the, in the living room. It's now, okay, We've taught our dogs sit in the living room. We have a, a foundation. Now we need to go ahead and apply what's called the three Ds, uh, distraction, uh, duration, and distance, right? So add distractions to that behavior in that one location, right? Add some, uh, some, some distance, right? Add some duration, right? Then we can go ahead and move that on to the next, to the next, uh, venue so if it's sit then we'll do it in the parking lot right or you know and we want to make it uh incrementally appropriate right we're not going to go oh you know uh our dog knows how to sit in the kitchen we're going to go to the ballpark 
and practice sitting out. Like that's just, it's, it's not appropriate. And ultimately it really sets our learner up for success. And our, our learner doesn't start to learn to, or doesn't enjoy learning. Mm-hmm. Right. So we want to um, foster a relationship that encourages learning, that makes learning safe and everybody's enjoying it and having fun. I love that. And and on that note of like the incremental, I think, you know, there, there's so many analogies that, that people have come up with and people talk about, but you know, it really is like, you know, it, when you're learning how to read, you know, you start with books that have, well, first you don't even start with books. You're just looking at like letters and what those sounds are. Right. And then, and then you slowly move up to like a book that has like two words per page. And then, you know, you're not going to say, okay, well, you got that starter book. Here's uh, Moby Dick, go ahead and read it, you know, preschooler. Like, and, and I think, I think as pup parents, we just, we just, get these unrealistic expectations and we want, and, and I, don't, I think it comes from a good place, right? We want our dog to be so well behaved. We want them to be able to be a part of their environment and go places with us, but we have to just kind of tame those expectations and be ready to, to take it step by step. So I, I love that analogy. So, so on that note, like let, maybe let's go with an example. I don't know, maybe we can do recall. So how are you, like, how can pup parents help their dog start to understand behaviors in a new environment? So it's like, okay, you know, I'm going to practice in my living room. What should, so once your dog has a good recall in the living room, what do you do once you're in your backyard? Do you go from where you already were in the living room or do you need to start over? Like, what does that look like? That's a great question. Uh, one thing I would first uh, recommend to anybody wanting to build uh, fluency and generalize that behavior is how and what um, capacity do you need that? So. Are you going to need it where you're around, you know, a crowd of a thousand people? Or are you a person that really doesn't leave the home? You live in a rural area. What is, what is it the, the criteria that you're going to need um, to generalize your dog to, right? And so I live, I live kind of in the country. Um, I'm on, you know, acreage. I, I have deer and things like that. So my dogs may not see, you know, have to recall from people or the mailman, but I'm gonna have to recall my my dogs from like deer, um, and you know wild animals, things like that. So I'm gonna first look at. I need to focus there, but I'm not gonna start there. I'm gonna build my way up, right? So if I do recall and in in my living room, I'm going to do it, uh, and always set my dog up for success, right? If my, if my dog can't do recall from two feet, my dog can't do recall from 10 feet, 15 feet, 20 feet, right? And I'm going to go at the learner's um, pace, right? Because once I start applying too much pressure, then it becomes uh, uh, not fun. And ultimately, there's learning is not occurring. So what I like to do is if I was practicing recall, and I was going outside, maybe I'd start on, you know, maybe I take it to my porch. And we again, we go back, we'd come back down the ladder. You know, I wouldn't start at 10 feet if I was got 10 feet in my living room. I'd start back down to one foot, right? I'd take a step back and then, you know, uh, recall. Now, a lot of times if we're not getting those behaviors, then we can continuously start to lower our criteria. So like, you know, uh, if, if they're not, if the, if the learner is not being um, successful, bring it back to the s- step that was last success. Right. So then, and then you build on that according to how well the learner is, uh, you know, uh, retaining that information. So if I'm understanding you correctly, you have to go back down the ladder as, as you said, you know, back, back to more simple things whenever we introduce a new environment. Right. So what, what happens if you get back to, because like, for example, one of my dogs scout, uh, this one right here, she is, quite reactive sometimes and she struggles with with recall and and sometimes like when we're outside she's so distractible she won't even take treats and so sometimes I feel like I'm going back to in my mind rung one of the ladder but she still isn't getting it like is there some instances where it's just like the environment's too much like what do you do in that situation absolutely the environment can be over stimulating um to arousing uh, where we're not getting success. And if that's the case, we need to go back to the, 
to the last step that we were successful, right? And um, and so, it, you know, you said uh, your dog wasn't able to take uh, treats. That That's an indication to me that there's some type of stress level where they're not where um, they're not comfortable taking, you know, a primary resource. So I would look into that for one. Um, but again, we, we, we go faster than the learner a lot of times. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's because we have these expectations that sometimes are not realistic and we need to reevaluate those expectations with, you know, uh, looking at science and uh, animal behavior and going, is this realistic for me to expect my dog to go from the living room and then go to the backyard where there's all this stim, you know, stimulating uh, things out there and expect them to do a behavior that they do not know? That makes 100% sense. I love, I love that explanation. And, and, and for me, like, to give you like, uh, a military uh, analogy, like, um, as a Marine, we, we trained uh, in many different environments um, in, in the States. It was, it was funny because I remember one time I was getting ready for a deployment to Iraq, and here I was in California in the mountains at you know, 13,000 feet in, in January, and I'm going, why are we hiking in the mountains in the snow? Like we're going to 140 degree weather, right? But we we were we were working in various different environments, applying those same those same skills that we learned when we were at home, you know, at Camp Pendleton on base, right? And then applying them, generalizing them to different environments. So when we did hit those other environments, we were to be more successful, right? I love that, and and I think you know that that's been my biggest thing as a pup parent, someone trying to train my dogs is like, I think so much of it is you have to practice what you want to have happen before it happens. Right. And I think that same thing goes for generalizing behaviors where it's like, okay, even if you practice in the backyard and you're, you're wanting to improve your dog's recall, like at a park around other dogs, like you need to go there first, like before there's even other dogs, like you need, you need to set your dog up for success. So I love that. So one, one kind of final ish wrap up question you know, I, I, I see, I do this almost every episode where, you know, we talk through things and I, I, I can still envision these, these pup parents who are frustrated and who are struggling. And, you know, wh- what is your advice to those people who seem to feel like, or maybe think like, okay, I, I, I think I've been doing these things that you're saying, but I still can't seem to like break through that like barrier, get over that last hurdle. Like what's your advice for those pup parents? Yeah. So uh, one I, I always tell everybody, let's let's define a plan, right? Without a plan, we don't have goals, we don't have benchmarks to hit, right? We don't know a direction. So one, find out a plan. Two, I would say, how do you want how does how do you want uh, your dog to behave towards the environments that you are gonna uh, interact with, right? It makes no sense for me to train. Uh, I, I don't. I mean, it can, but I don't need it. It's not necessary for me to train desert, uh, you know, behaviors in the desert when I'm in Pacific Northwest. It's really lush, you know. It, you know, I'm, I'm not really going to any deserts. I really don't want to. Uh, but you know, I, it, it, I could use my time a lot more effectively, right? So, knowing how what you're going to encounter, um, and then if once you're setting up and you have a plan start looking at if we're having if we're not having success one is our uh, expectations too high for that moment in the training plan um if so let's go ahead and back it back down right um and there's you know you can go back to even the foundations of luring that behavior to help jumpstart your your dog your learner right um two i would definitely check my uh reinforcement level is it high enough like uh, you know, you may be able great to give kibble in the living room, but like, is kibble the right currency for doing that out in an environment that's a lot more enticing, right? So check your check your reinforcement, uh, making sure that it's matching the environment and the behavior. Uh, then I would say, uh, let's if 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 we're ask, are we asking too much in that behavior? So maybe we need to break that behavior down even more. Right. So, uh, and, and, and reinforce more of, 
a close approximation to what we're looking for so that we're getting our learner to go ahead and go, yes, you're on the right path. Keep it up. Good job. Right. That way they have a, uh, a better understanding. Maybe we're not getting them enough information, right? We're kind of leaving a little bit of some uncertainty in there. So making sure we're communicating, you know, a lot more uh, effectively and clearly with them. Um, but ultimately, I think going at your learner's pace and ending before you get uh, frustrated. And I would definitely encourage pet parents to uh, seek more information from certified professionals. Um, start, you know, looking at more uh, resources, um, science-based uh, resources, and understanding how our dogs are communicating. Get to know your learner. Get to know your dog. Like in the Marines, it was, you know, know your Marines. Because when you know your, your, your learner, you're, not, you're able to know uh, their deficiencies, their strengths, um, and how, to, how they best um, take, you know, the communication. So that comes with relationship. Right. So maybe you don't you're not always training it. Maybe you you go to that environment and you play there first and you get them comfortable with the environment because your dog may not be comfortable in that environment. Right. We, we got to start looking at, OK, if we're not having success, let's look at what, why, you know, and start troubleshooting that. OK, so maybe you're in an environment where the dog is apprehensive about something in the environment. Let them go explore first. Mm -hmm. Maybe we go there and we and, and we um, create a positive association by just going there and playing for a couple times first, right? Maybe we jumpstart our learner with doing behaviors that they already know, like a default behavior, right? And giving them some wins under their belt first, right? Before we start to ask for things that we're, we're working on now. I love that. That is all really profound ideas and information. And I, 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 I imagine that a lot of pup parents listening to this are feeling like, okay, these are good things I can, I can move forward with. So uh, on that note, I've personally learned a lot. I'm sure pup parents have. Again, thank you so much for coming on, Richard. I, I loved having you on. I love this topic. I love, you know, I, I, I'm leaving this episode. Like I kind of want to leave work and just go start training my dogs. Like I'm kind of energized right now to go do that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and I think that's so important. And I think, you know, just one last kind of note for people who out there who are listening or watching and, and they are having some struggles right now with their dog's behavior and maybe feeling down, like push through it. Like it is possible. It is, it can be very, very difficult, um, but it is possible. Um, and, and on that note, um, like you were saying, Richard, for people to search out, you know, help from uh, certified positive reinforcement trainers and, and science backed information in the show notes here. We will include all of the relevant information for you to go connect with Richard. You can go follow him on Instagram. Uh, he's on TikTok. I've seen some of his reels. They're hilarious. It's a good time. So, you know, make, make sure that you go uh, connect with him. But thank you so much again, Richard, for, for coming on the episode. Yeah, I really appreciate it. And, I, you know, that you, you right there, that was my reinforcement. You saying you wanted to leave this podcast and go train. Like, that's what I'm here for. Like, I want my, I, honestly, my mission is to, to really change the pet guardians, uh, mindset, um, and on what pet guardianship is, right. I want to, I want to, I want to get people thinking before they even have a dog or go to go, you know, uh, bring a dog into their family is what do I need to do to be successful so that I can bring an, a, a, an animal into our life and have them be successful as well. And, you know, I, I want to change mindsets. I want to build, um, you know, pet parents with uh, building relationships, you know, and changing the mindset of, of what pet guardianship really is. I love it. And I, I love your mission. I think it aligns very closely to ours at Pupford. You know, we always say, our, you know, if we have one tagline, it's a better relationship with your pup. And we're all working on that. So, Take these, take these tips, take these ideas and go work on, you know, generalizing these behaviors with your dog and improving their behavior. And as always, I always like to say, please give us feedback. You know, if you liked this topic, you know, send us a DM on Instagram, email us, hello at Pupford, you know, let us know what you are struggling with or what you want to hear about or, or what's interesting to you. We, we look at all that feedback and we take it very seriously. Um, but outside of that, we will catch you guys on the next episode.